.NET is getting better and better and more important in the web development world nowadays. With the latest update to .NET 5, Microsoft combined the old .NET framework with .NET Core, one framework and SDK that is free, open source and cross-platform. Almost every request I get for new web development projects is asking for knowledge in .NET Core and also .NET 5, including web API and entity framework. So, knowing the fundamentals of back-end web development with .NET can be highly beneficial to your career. And that's where this course comes in. In a short period of time, you will learn how to set up a web API, make restful calls to this web API and also save data persistently with Entity Framework, Codefirst Migration, a SQL Server database and all three types of relationships in this database. We will get right to the point, you will see every single step of writing the necessary code and by the end of this course, you will have what it takes to say yes to all the .NETs and .NET Core project requests from any recruiter. The only tool you need in the beginning is Visual Studio Code, which is available for free. We will use Visual Studio Code for our implementations and make calls to the web API with the help of Swagger UI, an interface that lets you consume the API out of the box thanks to the latest version of the .NET framework. Visual Studio Code is available for Windows, macOS and Linux and since the .NET framework is cross-platform you can follow this course on any of these operating systems. Later we will utilize the free SQL Server Express with SQL Server Management Studio to manage our database. We will also have a quick look at SQLite so that you know how to use any database you want. The backend application we're going to build is a small text-based role-playing game where different users can register, we're going to use JSON web tokens for authentication and create their own characters like a mage or a knight, add some skills and a weapon and also let the characters fight against each other to see who is the best of them all. My name is Patrick and I will be your instructor for this course. I am a web developer for over a decade now. I have worked for big corporations and small teams as an employee and a contractor and I just love to see the way Microsoft is going with .NET and how important it gets day by day. So I hope you're ready for your new skills and your new projects. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the course. Welcome and thank you very much for joining the .NET Web API and Entity Framework Jumpstart course. This course is meant to teach you .NET skills fast and efficiently, so you will be ready to tackle any upcoming project with ease. This is what you will learn in the next couple of hours. In this chapter you will prepare your machine with Visual Studio Code and the .NET SDK and then you will already create your first web API with .NET and even make your first API call. After that you can create a Git repository for your project if you want to. Then we dive deep into the web API. You learn about the model view controller pattern and best practices for a clean web API structure and clean code. We'll get to asynchronous implementations with async and await, use data transfer objects, we will cover all CRUD operations, meaning create, read, update and delete, with the mostly used HTTP methods get, post, put and delete. We'll get to the details later. The following section provides persistence with Entity Framework. Entity Framework is an object relational mapper that will save all our changes in a SQL Server database. We will utilize code-first migrations to do that and again implement all CRUD operations. Then we'll cover authentication. Users will be able to register and log in and only see their related entities. We will use cryptography to hash the passwords and utilize JSON web tokens to authenticate the user with every subsequent web service call. Further on we'll have a look at all types of relationships in a database. That's one-to-one, one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships. Each one needs its own kind of implementation. And finally, since in this example project you will create some role-playing characters, we will let them fight against each other all by themselves by choosing their weapon or one of their skills. In the end, one character will have the most victories 
and that's what we want to display. Alright, you see there's a lot to learn, let's start. As soon as the .NET SDK and Visual Studio Code is installed, we can already create our first .NET application, which will be a web API right away. To start, I created a new folder called .NET RPG for .NET role playing game. Now we can open this folder with VS Code, just right click and then select Open with Code. I assume you are already a bit familiar with Visual Studio Code, if not feel free to have a look around. And while you're doing that, it might be also a good idea to install certain extensions. You can see on the left side here, we can open our extensions. I've got some installed, but disabled a lot just for this course. And the very first extension I recommend is C Sharp for Visual Studio Code by Microsoft itself. Now this extension will also be suggested by Visual Studio Code as soon as you create your first C Sharp application. It includes editing support, syntax highlighting, IntelliSense, go to definition, find all references. Just have a look, pretty useful stuff. Now the next one is C Sharp extensions by Joss Creative. It might speed up the development workflow by adding some entries to the context menu, like adding a new C Sharp class or interface for instance. All right, and then the last one already is one of my personal favorites, the material icon theme. Now this one simply provides lots and lots of cute icons, but that's not very important of course, I just love this extension. And another one maybe you want to install, not really necessary, but prettier is a formatter for Visual Studio Code. So if you want to format your code in a Visual Studio in maybe another way, then I recommend this extension. But the most important ones are really the C Sharp extension here for Visual Studio Code. And then this thing maybe C Sharp extensions for your context menu entries to create a new file, a new C-sharp class, new interface, and so on. All right, but now let's create our web API. And for that, we open a new terminal window. Let me just close this thing here. And then with terminal, new terminal, or your shortcut, you can open a new terminal window, as you can see right here. And now we will have a look what the .NET command provides. As you can see here, for now, not very much, but we can add a dash H to display some help. And this help will be the available commands. So .NET dash H. And the one that is interesting for us now is the new command right here, which creates a new .NET project. But we also got the run command, for instance. And uh, this one, well, is there to run our application. And we've got also the watch command down here, which can be used together with run to restart the application as soon as we make changes to any file. This is quite useful if you don't want to stop and start the project by yourself every single time you make any changes. Okay, and now with .NET new, we see all the available templates and there are a lot as you can see here. For instance, the plain old console application right on top. And further down, we finally get our web API here, ASP.NET Core Web API. It's still called Core in this case. This is the one we need, so let's use it. We simply type .NET new and then web API. All right, now we see some files that have been generated for us in the Explorer. I would say let's go through them real quick. Now at the bottom, we see the weather forecast class. This is just part of the default web API project. We don't really need it, but let's use this example in a minute. Now in the meantime, we get a little pop-up telling us that we should add some files. And of course we want to add them. 
you should see now that this VS Code folder with the launch JSON and the tasks JSON has been added. Both are configuration files for debugging, source code formatters, bundlers, and so on, but not very interesting for us at this moment. So let's have a look at the startup class next. Now here you can see the configure services and the configure method. And the configure services method is here for the apps services or to configure or register the apps services. So a reusable component that provides app functionality. We will register service in the future in this method so they can be consumed in our web service via dependency injection, for instance. Please don't mind all these buzzwords right now. We'll get to them throughout this course. Now, additionally, here you can see a configuration for Swagger or Swagger UI. This is new with .NET 5. Before with .NET 3.1, this was not available here out of the box. This is just there to test our web API then directly in the browser before you needed another client to test this like Postman for instance. But in this case now we will use Swagger. Okay, now the configure method creates the app's request processing pipeline, meaning the method is used to specify how the app responds to HTTP requests. As you can see, we're using HTTPS redirection and routing and so on. With all these use extension methods, we are adding middleware components to the request pipeline. For instance, use HTTPS redirection adds middleware for redirecting HTTP requests to HTTPS. The startup class is specified when the app's host is built and you see that in the program class. So let's open our files again. And here now in the program class in the create host builder method, there you can see it here, the startup class is specified by calling the use startup method. Now in the csproj file, we see the SDK and the target framework. Now it's .NET 5 and the root namespace. If you called your folder also .NET RPG, then this should be .NET underscore RPG as well. We also see a package reference to swashbuckle ASP.NET Core for Swagger UI and references for authentication that are also already added. You see that under the hood, the term .NET Core is still often used. Later on, we will find additional packages like Entity Framework in this file. Now regarding the app settings JSON files, we only need to know that we can add and modify some configurations here. More interesting for us is the launch settings JSON here in the properties folder where the current environment is configured and also the application URL. And with this URL, we will find our running web service. You can see it down here. We will use this one localhost 5001 for the HTTPS URL or the port 5000 for HTTP. All right, now the object and bin folders can be ignored for now. We find temporary object and final binary files here. Very interesting and often used throughout this course is the controllers folder. The first controller you see here is the generated weather forecast demo controller. We'll get to the details of controllers later, but for now it's only important to know that we can already call the get method down here. And I would say let's do exactly that in the next lecture. To start the application, we open the terminal and then enter .NET run. You see, here's already the URL we've seen in the launch settings JSON. So let's either open Chrome and enter the URL manually or just use the link right here. And when Chrome is open, you can see that there's not much to see here, but there is another URL available for us, which would be localhost 5001 for the HTTPS one, and then just slash swagger 
And with that, we see here the Swagger UI. It will help us to test our web API, but let's forget about Swagger for just a second. You can already see the weather forecast controller here, but we can also access the controller with the address bar of Chrome. Now, when we go back to Visual Studio Code, we can see the name of the controller, which would be weather forecast without the controller term. We also see this routing attribute here to define how to access this controller. We'll discuss how routes work in a future lecture. But just for now, this thing means that we can access this controller with its name again, just weather forecast. So we can just copy the name with a forecast, then go back to Chrome and enter the correct route. And finally, we should get the results. So we just enter the URL localhost 5001 and then weather forecast. And there are our results. Now, when we go back to Swagger, you see the controller weather forecast and also the schema here. Now the schema is actually the weather forecast class that tells us how the result of the web API call will look. And now above, that's not only the controller, it's actually the get call of the web API. We can see the available parameters. In this particular case, there are no parameters. And we also see the expected result down here, which would be an array of weather forecasts. And the best thing is we can try this out right here. So let's do that by clicking try it out. And then when we click execute, we see the request URL, which is the same thing we have entered in the address bar a minute ago, and we see the result. We can also see the result in the network tab of the developer tools of Chrome. Just hit F12, and then we go to network. We can filter by XHR, which stands for XML HTTP requests, and then just click execute again. And there is our weather forecast call and we see exactly the same result. Okay, great. This works. Now let's move on and build our own web service. Now there's one little thing we may do before we start with the web API. Let's create a Git repository for our project. If Git is not installed on your machine, please do that first. To do that, you can simply Google for it Git and then you should already see the Git website here and then you can go to downloads and then for your operating system, please download Git and install it. After that, on the left pane, we go to source control and choose to initialize a repository or we can directly publish this repository to GitHub. This is totally up to you. So for instance, just initialize the repository here. And then you see all these changes here. And the thing is, this is simply too many. We don't want to commit the bin and object folders, for instance. So we need a git ignore file to ignore certain files and folders. And to do that, we open the terminal again. We stop the application with control C, and then we simply enter dot net new git ignore. And with that, we are already good to go. You see that lots of file changes are not listed anymore because they are now ignored. Now we simply add our first commit message like initial commit and then commit all the changes with control and return. And then we are done. From now on, you can choose to commit your code whenever you want to get a clean history of your changes. I will do that too. Additionally, you can push your repository to GitHub now as well. Just click the cloud icon down here on the bottom left, and then you can publish your code to a private or a public GitHub repository. For instance, I can say this private repository here. And since I already got the .NET RPG repository, let's call this .NET 5 RPG. 
it is publishing the files to GitHub. And we are done. Now I can open this. And as you can see, here is the repository. And now don't get confused by the private label here. I will make this one public as soon as I'm done with recording this course. And then you can access the source code here, of course. So far, you learned how to create a web API project in .NET from scratch and how to make your first API call. In the upcoming sections, we will create a new controller and models for our role-playing game characters. Additionally, we will turn our synchronous calls into asynchronous calls, make use of data transfer objects or short DTOs, and change the structure of our web API so that it meets best practices. But first, let's have a look at the model view controller or short MVC pattern, which is the foundation of all this. Model view controller or short MVC is a software design pattern that divides the related program logic into three interconnected elements. Let me explain what every single one of these three elements stands for and how they collaborate. We start with the model. You could also say the data. A character in our role playing game is a model for instance. It can have an ID, a name, hit points, attributes, skills and so on. You as the developer know the code of your model, but the user won't see your code. That's where the view comes in. The user probably wants to see a representation of the character in HTML, plain text or amazing 3D graphics, depending on your game. In other words, the view is the graphical user interface or UI. To sum these two up, the model updates the view and the user sees the view. If the model changes, let's say our character gets another skill or its hit points decreased, the view will change too. That's why the model always updates the view. Now what's up with the controller? The controller does the actual work. There you will find most of your code because it manipulates your data or model. In our case, it's the web API that will create, update and delete your data. Since we won't have a view except the results of our calls in Swagger, we are going to build our application in the following order. First the model and then the controller. And we will always jump back and forth between those two. With the help of the view though, the user can manipulate the data, hence properties of the RPG character with buttons, text fields and so on. In a browser game that might be JavaScript code in essence, maybe with the help of frameworks like Angular, React or Vue.js or Blazor WebAssembly. This JavaScript code then, or c -sharp code in case of Blazor, uses the controller to do the manipulation and save these changes persistently in the database. The manipulated model will update the view, which is then again seen by the user and the circle starts all over again. Well, that sums up the MVC pattern. Now we're going to build our first model. The first things we need are new models. We need a model for the RPG character itself and also a model for the type of RPG character. This means a character class like Barbarian, Monk, Necromancer and so on. So first we create a models folder. Just right click and then click new folder and we call this models. And for the character model, we will create a new class in this models folder. If you have the C-sharp extensions installed, you can add a new C-sharp class with a right click and then select new C-sharp class. And now we call this character. And now let's add some properties. We can do this with prop and then hitting tab. And the very first one would be the ID. Then the next one, which is a string, is the name of the character and let me give this character already a default value like Frodo for instance. Then the character has hit points. So an integer hit points by default this should be a hundred. We give the character a strength attribute with value 10 also defense with value 10 
And the last one would be intelligence, for instance, also with the value 10. Now we also add an RPG class property. This means the type of the character, but first we have to create an enum for that. So let's add a new C-sharp enum called RPG class in our models folder. Right click again, new C-sharp enum, and we call this RPG class. Feel free to add any kind of role-playing class you want to add here. In this example, I use a knight, a mage, and a cleric. The most basic characters you would need, I guess. Some melee action, some magic, and of course, never forget the healer. Now, when we have the RPG class enum ready, we can go back to our character model and add it here. With prop and then RPG class, we call this class. And by default, I set this to the Knights, but again, this is totally up to you. All right, the first models are ready. Let's add a new controller now and make a get call to receive our first role-playing game character. To add a new controller, we create a new c -sharp class in the controllers folder, and we call this character controller. Now before we can start implementing any logic, we have to make this thing a proper controller. And to do that, we first derive from controller base. Like that, this is a base class for an MVC controller without view support. Since we're building an API here, we don't need view support. If however, we would want to add support for views, we could derive from just controller. But in our case, just make sure to add controller base. And to be able to use this class, we also have to add a using directive. You can either just click control and period for this quick fix menu here, or you click the light bulb, and then you would also see the suggestion to you to add the using directive for Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC. And after that, we have to add some attributes, and the first one would be API controller. This attribute indicates that a type and also all derived types is used to serve HTTP API responses. And additionally, when we add this attribute to the controller, it enables several API specific features like attribute routing and automatic HTTP 400 responses if something is wrong with the model. We get to the details when we make use of these features. Now regarding attribute routing, that's already the next thing we have to add actually. So below the API controller attribute, we add the route attribute like that. And you have already seen this. We can then add in brackets the string controller. This means that this controller can be accessed by its name. In our case, that would be character. So that part of the class name that comes before controller. All right, let's get into the body of our C sharp class. The first thing I'd like to add is a static mock character that we can return to the client. So private static, then character, and then knight as name for our character, and that's simply a new character. And of course, we have to add the reference .NET RPG models for that. Next, we finally implement the get method to receive our game character. So we start with public, and then the return type is an I action result, and we call this method simply get. Now the return type I action result because this enables us to send specific HTTP status codes back to the client together with the actual data that was requested. In this method, we can use return okay and then 
knight and with ok knight we send the status code 200 ok and our mock character back. Other options would be something like bad request 400 or a 404 not found status code. For instance, we could choose something like bad request. That would be the status code 400 or not found for 404, but we use OK for status code 200 now. Now the code is already implemented and I would say we test this. So we save this, then open the console and enter .NET watch run this time because in this case with the help of the watcher when we change the code the app will rebuild itself automatically and now while i did this you can already see the error here in the terminal or when chrome was opened automatically we see the error here fail to load api definition and back to the terminal we see something like ambiguous HTTP method for action. It further states that actions require an explicit HTTP method binding for Swagger or Open API 3.0. So we have to go back to our class here and when we have a look at the get method and the attribute above exactly there is none now when we compare this to the weather forecast controller here we can see that we could have added an http get attribute but that's not really necessary for the character controller because the web api supports naming conventions and if the name of the method starts with get like we did it here the api assumes that the used http method is also get Apart from that, we only have one single get method in our controller so far, so the web service knows exactly what method is requested. Still, as we now know, to help Swagger out, we have to add the HTTP get attribute, but let's go back to Chrome one more time and let's try to use the character controller and the get method with the address bar same way we did it with the weather forecast controller before. We just have to enter the character controller name here and here is our knight already. So I want to make sure with this that this is only necessary for Swagger. If you're adding some kind of other interface for this web API, you wouldn't really need to add this get attribute, but we want to use Swagger, so let's add it anyways. We go on top of the method and add HTTP get and now Swagger should know that this is a get method. We don't see an error anymore and the, the website has been reloaded thanks to our watcher and now we see our get method here. But there's still one problem now we don't see a new schema and we would expect the RPG character here, right? So again, we have to change something. When we have a look at VS Code, we see that we returned an I action result. And you see, you have seen already that with Chrome, that was totally fine. You could use it that way. But to make sure that Swagger knows what we expect here, we have to change the return type. And for that, we can use an action result with the type character and let's save that again and now finally when the app has been rebuilt we see the information we want to see we see our character class here and we also see our rpg class with the values 0 1 and 2 so there's still one little thing we can add this thing here 0 1 and 2 may not be exactly what we want. So we can change this by configuring the JSON converter in the enum file. So we go back to VS Code, go to our enum file RPG class and above the definition of this enum we add an attribute which is JSON converter that we need using system text JSON serialization 
and then in brackets we say type of and then json string enum converter and that's it now the app is rebuilding by itself we have a look at swagger open our rpg class and now we see the strings knight mage and cleric and finally we can test our method here try out execute and here you see the request url and you get our frodo now before we start with a new method let's add another mock character to the controller by replacing this single character with a list of characters because we will implement an additional method to return that list so this would be then a list here of a character. We call this characters. And this is then a new list like that. We need another using directive for system collections generic for the list type. We can remove our knight here. And then we say new character, which would be our default character, who is Frodo. And then let's add another one. And we call this one Sam, like that. And the attributes should be still the same. All right, and after that, we have to modify our existing get method we now return a complete list of characters. So we change the return type here to list character. And down here, of course, we return our characters. Let's save that and then test our modification with Swagger. We go to our methods click try it out and then execute and here are our RPG characters. We can also see that the expected result here is an array of characters and this is already a good sign because Swagger knows what we expect here. So this works but now let's add another get method to return a single character. So down here we have again an HTTP get method, public action results, and in this case now just a character. We call this method get single for instance, and just for testing purposes, we return OK, and then simply the first character, and we save this. While our application was rebuilding, we can already see that there seems to be a problem with our implementation. The terminal says there's a conflicting method or path combination and actions require a unique method or path combination. So this means the web API doesn't know which method to use because we have two get methods. That's where we have to add routing attributes. So let's add one to the first method now. We close the terminal and down here we can say route is the same as above the controller class. And then we add the string get all to give this method the route get all. So you see with route and then a string we can decide how to get to a particular method and after we save that change building the application works now and it's time to try this out. So in Swagger we see two methods now get all and the other one and this thing here returns a single character. We can try this out again with execute and we get the first one which is Frodo and get all here returns all our characters. You see that the request URL here of the method to receive all characters is a bit different now. We use the controller name and then after a forward slash we have to add get 
all. All right, but there's still one more thing we can do, which is combining the route with the HTTP method. And that's quite simple. We close the terminal and instead of using the HTTP get and the route attributes, we can simply add the route here together with the HTTP get attribute like that. So we just write HTTP get and then in brackets the route. We save this. And again, the result is exactly the same here in Swagger. Now, since receiving the first RPG character of a list can get quite boring, let's add an argument to our request next. To get a particular RPG character, we could send the ID of this certain character to the web service. To do that, first we have to add the ID to our mock characters in the controller. Now the default value is zero, so let's just add the ID one to Sam. Now it's getting interesting. We add a new parameter to the get single method and use the link to find the RPG character with the given ID in the list of all characters. So first the parameter, which would be an integer, simply the ID. And then down here we say characters and then we use first or default, the method first or default like that to find the character. For that we need a link, as I already said, we have to add the using directive system link. And then with a Lambda expression, we say C for character, where then the ID of the character equals the given ID, which should actually be in lowercase like that. So with first or default and this lambda expression here, the function goes through every character in the characters collection here and then returns the one that has exactly the same ID that was given with the method now. One more information I want to add here, we use first or default because if we don't find the character with the given ID here, we would return null as result, but there's also the function called first and this one would throw an exception if there was not a character found, but this is just a side note. We used first or default here and we're fine with that. Okay, and now the last thing we would have to do is adding the ID also to the attribute up here. And we can do that again in brackets. And then since this is an argument or a parameter, we add ID in curly brackets here. So this is actually the route. We could use the route attribute here as well, or we use the combination again. And with that, we say HTTP get, and then the route ID in curly brackets to make sure that this is a parameter. Okay, and that's it. The parameter in the route has to match the parameter name in the function itself. That's also quite important, of course. And now we can test that. So we go back to Swagger. And we already see the new URL here with the ID parameter. And we can click try it out. And then zero would be our default character. We click execute. And here's Frodo. And when we now enter ID one and click execute, we get Sam back. Beautiful. And to double check, you can also see the new request URL here. It's character and then forward slash and the ID of the character you want to get from the service. Okay, so this works just fine. And before we implement more methods in the controller, let's have a look at the various HTTP request methods we will cover in this course. The hypertext transfer protocol or in short HTTP defines as the MDN web docs put it, a set of request methods to indicate the desired action to be performed for a given resource. To this date, we can find nine request methods in the documentation. The most common ones are get, post, put, and delete. 
These are the ones that are covered in this course because you almost always can do everything that needs to be done with only these four. Let's go over them shortly. The get method requests a representation of the specified resource. If you're using this request, you should only receive data from the web service and not send data to it. Of course, you might want to send certain characteristics to the service like an ID or a string and the backend then grabs the proper object from the database, but you won't send any objects to the service. You have already seen this when you received our RPG characters. Sending objects to the service in turn would be done with a POST request. The POST method is used to submit an entity to the specified resource, often causing a change in state or side effects on the server. This means that you might want to add a complete new RPG character to the database, for instance. POST means, to put it simply, add or create a new object and do whatever you want to do with that object in the backend. Usually this new object will be stored in a database. The PUT method replaces all current representations of the target resource with the request payload. So this is in essence an update of the complete object. If you want to change a property of an RPG character, let's say just the name for example, you would send the whole object to the service and it would overwrite the complete entry in the database. Of course, there can be variations of that process, but the standard way is exactly that. Send an object to the service that already exists and update every property of this object. And finally, the delete request. You know it already, the delete method deletes the specified resource. So you send an ID to the service via the URL. The service usually looks up the corresponding entry in the database and erases it. If you rather want to do a soft delete, meaning just set a flag so that this entry will not be shown on the client, it's actually an update where you would then use the put request method. But to make one thing clear, nothing works automatically. You have to write all the service methods by yourself and define which HTTP request method has to be used by the client. You could in fact write a service method that uses get, but then simply delete an object with a given ID. It's all up to you. Now, how do the CRUD, meaning create, read, update and delete, operations match with the HTTP request methods in general? Maybe you know it already. To create an object you would use POST, reading an object is done with a GET call, updating with PUT and deleting, well, with DELETE of course. Now that you know the most important HTTP methods, let's continue with the web API by creating a controller method to add a new character. The idea behind that is that the client, in our case the browser, sends a JSON object to the service and the service then creates a new character based on the JSON data. So let's start writing the method. We will call the method addCharacter and we will return all our characters so that we directly see the change of our characters list. So down here, we add a new method. Again, it's a public method, of course, with the return type action result. And then, as mentioned, a list of all our characters. We call the method add character. And as a parameter, we use our character type and we call this parameter new character. Now in the body of the function, we simply add the new character to the characters list. And then again, we return the complete list so that we can see that the new character is part of it. We add the character with characters add and then new character. And then we return OK characters. Last but not least, we add an attribute to this method and that would be now HTTP POST because then we are able to send data to the service. 
It's important to mention that the data or the JSON object respectively is sent via the body of this request. When we sent the ID to the service earlier, we did it via the URL. Now it is done with the body. That's a crucial difference. All right, let's test that now. Make sure that you run the application if it's not already running with .NET run or .NET watch run. And then let's open Chrome and have a look at Swagger. We see a new post method. Now opening this method, we already see an example object we could send via the body and the request type here is properly set to application JSON because we sent a JSON object to the web API. Now let's go to try it out and then for our test we can remove most of the properties and send a new RPG character with just an ID and the name to the service. And for the name let's use Percival. And now after hitting execute we see our complete list with the new character Percival as a knight. Now we can also double check this of course in the developer tools with F12, we open them and then in the network tab filtered to XHR, we can hit execute again and we see our call here and also the result with now another Percival, but keep in mind we don't store the data persistently for now. So when we add another character like we did already, we get four in total, but as soon as we stop the web service and start it again, the list consists of the two initial mock characters and the added characters are gone. Currently we are doing all the logic of our web service calls in the controller. The thing is, if an application or a web service is growing, you might want to separate the work into different classes. Or if you need to do the same work over and over again, you don't want to copy your code and paste it into different controllers, of course. That's where services come in. The controllers should actually be pretty simple and just forward data to the service and return the result to the client, nothing else. To be able to do that, we will inject the necessary services into the controller. So we will use dependency injection. The great thing about dependency injection is that you're able to use the same service in several controllers. And if you want to change the actual implementation of a service, you just change one service class and you don't have to touch every single controller where you're using this service. We'll come to the details when we actually implement this stuff. So the client sends a request to the web API. The controller takes this request, calls the corresponding service method. The service then does all the magic, like getting an RPG character out of the database, for instance. And then the result goes back to the controller and then to the client. That's it. Apart from that, we can also introduce the idea of data transfer objects or short DTOs. We already have models, but it's common to use these DTOs for the communication between client and server. The difference is this, DTOs are objects you won't find in the database. This means they won't be mapped. Models in turn are a representation of a database table. When we have a look at our RPG character model, later on we will see a table in the database that has exactly the same properties or fields. Let's say we add the field date created or is deleted. That's information the user does not need to see. In this case, we want to save this information in the database, but don't want to send it back to the client. That's where the DTO comes in. We grab the model and map information of the model to the DTO. There are libraries that do this for us like AutoMapper, so we don't have to do this manually. Apart from that, we can also create DTOs that combine properties of several models. They simply give us more freedom in what we want to return to the client. And it's not only about returning data. You've already seen the example of creating a new character. In that case, we could use a DTO as well. So an object with certain information the client sends to the web service. The service then grabs these information and maps them to the actual model. We'll use DTOs in future lectures so that everything should become clear. All right, enough with the theory. Let's build the structure in our project now. 
So let's implement a clean structure now. We start with creating new folders. So we go to the file explorer here and the first one is the services folder. So right click, new folder. We call this one services. And in there I want to create a folder for the character service. So let's call this one character service. Now in that folder we create an interface and an implementation class. So right click again and then new C sharp interface and this one will be called I character service and then we add the implementation class character service. Now the interface gets three methods and these are in essence the methods you already know from the controller. So the first one would return a list of characters and this is the get all characters method. And don't forget of course to add some using directives here. First system collections generic for the list and for the character we need .NET RPG models. Then the second method is get character by ID, which only returns one single character. So character get character by ID. And here we add a parameter, which is the ID. And the last one already also returns a list of characters. And this is our add character method where we give this method a new character like that. And now we go to the implementation class and of course we want to use the interface here. So we add it and we see directly an error that says that the interface methods are not implemented and of course we can fix that either by again hitting control and period on your keyboard or you use the light bulb here which is the quick fix menu and simply click implement interface. And as you can see, the methods have been generated for us, but we still have to implement the bodies, of course. Now to implement the bodies, we can actually just jump between the character controller and the character service and copy and paste the code, but we have to remove the okay method call when we return the result. So for instance, add character here in the add character controller, we just, Copy this one here and add it here. And of course, you can already see that we need the characters list. But first, let's finish the methods. Back to the controller. We want in the get method, we want to return all characters. So simply return characters and get character by ID. Where is it? Here it is. We return the character with the given ID and we remove the OK function here like that. And now finally we copy our list of characters of course like that. And down here for the first or default method, we add the using directive for system link. And this is our service now. Now regarding the character controller, we have to implement some more changes. So let's go to the character controller. And the very first thing we need now is a constructor. And for that, we can also use a snippet like prop for the properties in our models. And in this case, we can use CTOR and hit tab to add the constructor. And now the parameter we want to add here is the I character service. And we call this one character service. And again, we need the proper using directive. In this case, now it's services character service. And then we can do another thing we can create a new private field for the character service. Again, we hit control and period, and then we say initialize field from 
parameter. And then we've got a private read only variable here. And what I like to do is adding an underscore in front of the variable name. So we don't have to use this to properly set this value here. So now we already inject our new character service into the controller. You see, this is how we use dependency injection. And of course, finally, we can remove the static list of characters here. And regarding the bodies of the methods, we have to call this new character service now. So the code inside the brackets of the OK statement has to be replaced by the corresponding character service method. So regarding get, this would be underscore character service and then get all characters. Then get single would be character service, get character by ID and then the ID. And the last one would be character service, add character with the new character. All right, let's test this now in Swagger again. For instance, let's test the method get all and just click try it out and then execute. And then we're getting an error that states unable to resolve service for character service i character service while attempting to activate the character controller. Now the web API wants to inject the i character service but doesn't know which implementation class it should use. So we better tell it. So we go back to Visual Studio Code and then we have to go to the startup CS file. And in here in the configure services method, we have to register our character service. And to do that, we add services, add scoped, and then I character service, character service, which in essence means we want to tell our application that if a controller wants to inject the I character service, then the corresponding implementation class would be the character service class. And again, we have to add the character service reference, of course. The beauty of that is that whenever we want to change that and use another implementation class, for instance, we just change this line and we're done. So let's say you want to add another character service called character service two, you only change this single line and then the application would know as soon as you inject an I character service, you want to use the character service two here instead of the character service. And with add scoped, we create a new instance of the requested service for every request that comes in. There are also the methods add transient and add singleton. As you can see right here, there's add transient and add singleton. But we will use add scoped. But just so you know, Add transient provides a new instance to every controller and to every service, even within the same request. And add singleton creates only one instance that is used for every request. Now we will only need add scoped. Now let's save this and go back to Swagger again. It is reloading. And now when we test our get all call, Try it out and execute. We are getting all our characters here, Frodo and Sam. And of course we can test this with the other method, methods as well. Let's say we wanna get Sam here, execute. We get Sam and of course we can add a character. We can use the default body here because this will be removed anyways when we restart the service. And as you can see, we now have our RPG character called string. All right, this works just fine. Now let's continue with asynchronous calls next. What are asynchronous calls and why should you bother? Put simply with a synchronous call, 
you would give a task to a thread, like fetching data from a database, and the thread waits for this task to be finished and wouldn't do anything else until this task is done. Now with an asynchronous call, this thread wouldn't wait at all. Instead, it would be open for new tasks, and as soon as the other task, for instance fetching data from the database, is done, it would grab the data and return it. In our current application, this isn't really necessary. We have no database calls that take lots of time. Our tasks are done in milliseconds. Additionally, it's very likely that you have more than one thread available for your application. So even if one thread is waiting for a task, another thread can do another task. But in large applications with lots of users, it can really happen that all threads are busy. In this case, your app won't respond to a request anymore, which leads to a terrible user experience and you may even lose users or even paying customers because of this. So this can lead to serious trouble. And that's why it doesn't hurt to know this and also implement it early in this project. Now, although the methods in the character service won't do anything asynchronous, they will later on when we fetch data from the database. So let's start off with the iCharacter service interface. I have it open already. Now here, the only thing we have to do is add the task type to our return types. So simple as that. We add task and then the actual type that is returned in brackets. And for that, again, we have to add another reference. In this case, it's system threading tasks. And we do the same for the other methods here task and the closing brackets. And after that, of course, we have to go to our implementation class, the character service, and we have to add the task return type here as well, like that, add the using directive, and we have to add another keyword here, which would be async to make this really an asynchronous method and we do the same of course for the other methods async task and here for the get character by id as well so now we've got asynchronous methods and don't mind the warnings here for now. The code will still be executed synchronously, but when we add entity framework with database queries later on, we will have asynchronous calls. All right, but now last not least is the character controller. Again, we have to add the task type with the corresponding using directive of course and also the async keyword to every method so we return here a task action result and also we add the async keyword and the using directive the same for the get single method async task and the last one, async task for the add character method. And then the last thing we have to do in every single method is add the await keyword to the actual service call. And that's how we call an asynchronous method. And as you can see, the warning here, at least in the controller, is gone so we add a wait here as well now we are having an asynchronous calls in this method and here as well so the controller is fine now with the asynchronous methods we make asynchronous calls here but regarding the service we will do this later all right that's it we save everything and make test calls again with swagger but they should return exactly the same results Again, please don't mind that making all these methods asynchronous is not necessary for such a small project, but you're here to learn something, I guess, so that's how you should do it with large applications. Another practice you might come along in professional projects is to return a wrapper object to the client with every service call. Advantages are that you can add additional information to the returning results, like a success or exception message. 
The frontend is able to react to this additional information and read the actual data with the help of HTTP interceptors, for instance, and we can make use of generics to use the correct types. So let's add that object to our models first. In our models folder, we create a new C -sharp class and we call this service response. Now the actual name of the class is service response T, where T is the actual type of the data we want to return. And then of course we can add some properties. So the very first one would be of type T and this is the actual data we want to return. For instance, the characters. Then we add another one, which I would like to add. This is just a flag bool success, which by default is set to true. So this states if a call was actually successful. And then another one, the last one already is a string message, which is now by default. And this one is there to display a message in the front end, for instance. Maybe when you add a character, you can add something like character was added or created, or if an error occurs, you can also display the error here, of course. Now, similar to the asynchronous implementations, we don't really need that now, but you will thank me later when you're working on bigger projects where these kinds of things come in quite handy. For instance, when you catch exceptions in a try-catch block, a service response like this might help you. Anyways, to make use of our new service response, we have to modify the return types of our character service and I character service methods again. So let's start with the I character service. We simply add the service response class here. So this is a service response with the type list character. And here we return a service response with a character and here again it's a list of characters. And after that again we make the changes in the character service so here it's a task and then the service response with the list of the character down here also a service response with list character and then service response character. Now of course we also have to make changes to the actual implementations of the methods. In general we create a new service response object in every method and set the data property accordingly. So for instance in the add character we can start with the service response, so bar service response, and this is simply a new service response with a list character. We add the new character, but then we set the service response data to our characters list, and in the end, we return the service response. Now regarding get all characters, we can actually copy this thing here and add it. We have a service response with the list of characters and we also set the data and then simply return the service response. And down here we have a new service response with a character type, no list. And then we say that our service response data is the actual result. So the character we're looking for. And then we return the service response here. Now, last but not least, we also add the service response as return type to the methods of the character controller. So here now it's an action result of a service response. The same here. And also, of course, down here. 
and this helps now to see the proper changes in Swagger UI. Now a first look at Swagger already shows us down here two new types, a service response for a single character and a service response for a list of characters. We can open this of course and you can see the data, the success and the message fields and also here the single character and here now this is an array or a list, you see it in the, the, with the brackets here and then there is the actual character with of course the RPG classes and apart from that when we open a method here like get all we see that the uh, result of the methods look a bit different now the example value here as you can see we have it we have the data with an array of the character here it's the data with only one character and when we try this now and hit execute it's exactly the same. We see the data and in here now there's the list of the character and down here let's try this at the proper ID hit execute and we see the character Frodo in the data field. So you see that our characters are wrapped now in our service response. The front end could react to the new properties and provide a smooth user experience with pop-up notifications or something similar instead of presenting complex exception messages in the console or worse, a frozen application in case of an error. You already heard about them, now it's time to use DTOs. First things first, let's create a folder called DTOs, so new folder, DTOs, and then in there we create another folder called character for our character DTOs, so all the data transfer objects regarding the role-playing game characters. As already mentioned, the idea behind DTOs is that you've got smaller objects that do not consist of every property of the corresponding model. When we create a database table for our RPG characters later in this course, we could add properties like the created and modified date or a flag for the soft deletion of that character and we don't want to send this data to the client. So we map certain properties of the model to the DTO, which would be the case of returning data to the client, but it also works the other way around. We already created a new RPG character by only providing an ID and a name, for instance. So why not use a type that only consists of these two properties or other properties we want to use. This is even more important when you build a front end that should use a specific type for the creation of a new character. At the moment we have these two cases, receiving RPG characters from the server and sending a new character to the server. So let's create two classes called getCharacterDTO and addCharacterDTO. So in our folder now, DTO's character, we first add get character DTO and then another one add character DTO. Regarding the get character DTO it should look exactly the same as the character model for now. I know it does not seem to make sense but I don't want you to be overwhelmed by implementing anything entity framework related at the same time. So let's just copy exactly the same properties for now in the add char uh, in the get character in DTO and of course we add the using directive for our RPG class and the add character DTO looks a bit different now let's say we want to send every property but the ID to the service so again we can copy and paste the properties but we can remove the ID from there and also add of course the using directive for our RPG class. So now that we have our DTOs ready we can use them in our controller and service methods and let's start with the interface. We go to the I character service class and instead of the character type we can now return the get character DTO. So get character DTO, and of course we need another using director for that. 
details character and we do the same for the other methods get character dto get character dto and the parameter of the add character method now is of type add character dto and of course we have to make the same changes in the character server so here it's the add character dto as parameter in the add character method and here now it's the get character dto let's just copy this replace also the type here for the service response same in the get all characters method and also here in get character by id and we do the same of course in the character controller so here it's the get character dto the same here and here and the parameter for the add character method is add character dto all right now the character controller has no error anymore but as you can see here visual studio is not happy with that change the types do not really match and that's where we have to map the DTOs now with the model. It is time for AutoMapper. Now we could map the objects manually by creating a new instance of the necessary class and then setting every property one by one. But the idea behind AutoMapper is that it's doing exactly that for us on the fly. But first we have to install AutoMapper. Of course. Now there's a package available on NuGet.org. It's AutoMapper Extensions Microsoft Dependency Injection. And this is the one we want to install. So in Visual Studio Code, to install this package, we go to the terminal. And first we stop the application. And then we enter .NET add package and then the name of the package so auto mapper extensions microsoft dependency injection so dot net add package auto mapper dot extensions dot microsoft dot dependency injection without any specific version to install the latest package Now when the installation is done, we should see a new entry here in our project file. There it is, AutoMapper extensions and so on with version 8.1.0 in my case. Could be of course that there's a newer version available in your case. And after that, we jump to the startup CS and we go to the configure services method. And in here we have to register AutoMapper. Now in the configure services method, we register AutoMapper with services and then add AutoMapper and then type of startup like that. And of course we have to add another using directive. So we hit control period and then using AutoMapper. Now to be able to use the mapping of AutoMapper, we now need an instance of the mapper in our service. So we go to our character service again. And up here now we add a constructor similar to our character controller. So we hit CTOR, that's the character service. And now we inject I mapper and call this mapper. We add the using directive automapper. And here again, we can use initialize field from parameter. And again, add an underscore. And now we can use the mapper to set the correct types to the data property of our service response. And let's start with the get character by ID method here we can use the map function. So we call our mapper and then map. And then we first decide in angle brackets 
which type the value should be mapped to and the parameter of this function is the actual object that will be mapped. So we want to map the character to a get character DTO and then our parameter is simply the character with the given ID. Now regarding the other changes here in the add character method for instance, we want to map the add character DTO to a character object, so it's the other way around. And in this case, we say mapper map and then to a character, and this is then the new character as parameter. And now to map the whole characters list in one line and then give it to the service response, we use the select method of link followed by a lambda expression where we map every single character object of the list into a get character DTO. So instead of just setting the data to characters, we say select and then the lambda expression. So for every character, we want to use our mapper and map the result to a get character DTO. And this here then is the character. And in the end, we turn everything into a list like that. And of course, we can do exactly the same with the get all characters method here. All right, we save everything and run the application. And then we test this with swagger. For instance, let's use the get all method. We hit try it out and then execute. And then we're getting an error. So it seems AutoMapper does not know how to map character into a character a DTO, as you can see right here. Missing type map configuration or unsupported mapping. Now you might ask, it's called AutoMapper, so why isn't this working? automatically. Well, we have to configure one more thing, but then I promise AutoMapper is working fine. We have to create maps for the mapping and this is organized in profiles. You could create a profile for every mapping, but let's spare the hassle and just create one class for all profiles for now. So back to Visual Studio again. And now in the file explorer at root level, we create a new C sharp class and we call this one auto mapper profile. And then this class derives from profile just profile, and then we have to add the using directive using auto mapper. And regarding the implementation, we need a constructor with no parameters, so CTOR, and we can remove the parameter. And then we create the map for the necessary mapping, and that would be create map, and then character, and then get character DTO. And of course, we have to add the using directives so that would be our DTOs and this now is our models reference. All right, now let's try this again with Swagger. We go to the get all methods, click try it out, hit execute, and now we're getting all our characters. If for whatever reason it does not work in your case, please first try to stop the application with control C like that and then run it again with a .NET watch run for instance, and then test this again. And then hopefully this should work because the thing is that this auto mapper profile class, maybe you were already wondering, it, it's not registered manually by ourselves. So this is a convention that auto mapper uses here. It looks for files or classes that are derived by the profile class and maybe this does not work with the watcher for some reason. So if it doesn't work in your case, please stop and restart the application manually. So receiving the list of characters 
works. What about getting a single character? You try this, for instance, with Frodo. This works as well. But what about adding a character now? So we try this, hit execute, and we are getting an error again. We cannot map the add character DTO to the character. So we have to add another mapping in the auto mapper profile. So let's just add create map. And now we want to map a, an add character DTO to a character. We save this. Go back to Swagger and let's try this again. And now it's added. So you see everything works now, but there's one tiny thing. The ID here is zero. So we already have this ID and this shouldn't be the case actually. But of course, it's because the add character DTO does not provide an ID. That's exactly what we wanted, but still let's fix this by generating a proper ID ourselves. So back to Visual Studio, we go to the add character method here. And what I want to do now is I first want to create the character based on the DTO and then set the correct ID by finding the current max value in the characters list and then increase this value by one. So what we can do is we can first say we have our character or well, let's use the type here. So our character is the new character in this case. And then we say that the character ID is characters max. And then with the lambda expression, we have a look at the IDs of all the characters. And then we simply increase this value by one. And then again, we add this character to the character list like that. So I first create the character object here, then have a look at the maximum value for the ID of all the characters, increase it by one, and then add this resulting character to the characters array, saved it. And now we can test this again with Swagger. We go to our post character method, try this out, hit execute. And now without even sending an ID, the RPG character gets the correct one. Later, when we use Entity Framework, it will generate the proper ID by itself. All right, we are done here. I know it was a lot and maybe way too much implementation for such a small project, but in large real world applications, that's how it's done. To modify or update an RPG character, we have to add a new method to the I character service interface, the character service class and the character controller. So let's go to the interface and start here. And here now we need an update character method. So the return type first is task service response and then return let's return the character again to see the results we call this method update character and now we use a new dto an update character dto and we call this parameter updated character and of course we have to add this dto now so let's add it real quick in our DTOs folder character. We add a new class and we call this one update character DTO. And we can actually copy and paste all the properties of the get character DTO. We add the using directive for the models. And now we can implement this method in the character service. We first implement the interface automatically. And here is our method now. First thing we can add is the async keyword. And then we start with 
the service response. So var service response would be a new service response with a get character DTO. And then we try to find the RPG character with the given ID of the updated character in the characters list, similar to the get method. So character character would be characters first or default. And then again in a lambda expression character where the character ID is in our case the updated character ID. And now after that we overwrite almost every property of this RPG character one by one, meaning the name, hit points, strength, defense, intelligence and the class. Now we could use auto mapper here with a line like mapper map and then updated character character and also we can then add the corresponding mapping to the auto mapper profile and I encourage you to try this out by yourself but keep in mind though that with using auto mapper here every single property will be mapped. Maybe even data you don't want to be overwritten like fighting statistics we will add later in this course. So let's do this manually now. We say character name updated character name and our character hit points are the updated character hit points character strength is the updated character strength and then a character defense is the updated character defense we're almost done we've got the intelligence And then the last one would be the class. And again, that's important because I want to make this clear. We could do something like mapper, map, and then updated character to character. But again, in this case, later in this course, we will add something like character fights and victories and defeats. And in this case, this, this would be overridden or mapped with default values. And maybe you don't want this. So that's why we are doing this manually here. Anyways, in the end, we set the service response data with now the mapper map and then get character DTO and then character. And in the end, we return the service response. All right, off to the character controller right here. We have to add another method, of course. And now this is a put method. So we use HTTP put here. And then we add public async task action results with a service response with a get character DTO. The method is called update character, of course, with an update character DTO called updated character. And similar to the other methods, we just call our character service with the update character method and then updated character. All right, it's time to test this with Swagger. First, let's get all our characters for reference. So we hit try it out and then execute. Here's Frodo and Sam. And now let's use our update methods. We try it out and we just keep the request body as it is. Hit execute. And then we see the result here. 
So let's double check with receiving all the characters again. And we see that Frodo is now called a string and he has no hit points, no strength, nothing. It's good that this will be changed again when we restart the application. So again, keep in mind that every single property has been updated. This means the strength, defense and so on will be overridden, even though we do not send a value for these properties with the body. If you would run another update and leave the RPG class, Frodo would be turned into a knight in any case, because that's the default value. So you have to pay attention to how you design your front end in this case. Do you want to update single properties or all at once by receiving the current values of the character and save them back again, even though they did not change? All right. That was just a side note, but now let's try to update a character that doesn't exist. Just change the ID to 2 for instance. So here we say ID 2 and hit execute. And now we are getting a null reference exception. Object reference not set to an instance of an object because of course the ID does not exist. We have two options now, either we catch that exception with a try catch block or we just check if we find a character in the characters list or we do both. So let's start with a try catch block back to Visual Studio and the character service here. We start with the try block after we define the service response. So we just add try. And let's put this bracket down here. And then we add catch exception x for instance. And of course add the using system directive like that. And in the case of an error, we can already set the service response success in this case to false and the service response message to exception message like that. That's it already. So let's test that again with the put method here. Try it out and add ID two. hit executes. And now we get the actual service response with the message object reference not set to an instance of an object. Now a possible front end can work with that. Maybe another message would be more suitable for the user. Alternatively, we can add a slight modification to the character controller. So back to VS code and to the character controller here. You might have seen that we're still getting a status code 200 OK. Well, a character wasn't found, so maybe we can also return a 404 not found response. So first, let's get the result in our first line and define this as a response like that. And then we can check if the response data is actually null. And in this case, we return uh, not found with the response. And in the other case, we still return an OK, but now with the response here. Again, I haven't saved this yet. So when you have a look here, we are getting a 200 okay as a result although the character has not been found and now i save this and the application is rebuilding by itself swagger is reloading and now when we try this add id or use id2 hit execute we are actually getting a 404 now feel free to play around with that. For instance, you do not have to use the message of the service response only in case of an error. What about a success message like your character has been saved? Anyways, let's move on and remove an RPG character next. To delete an RPG character, again, we have to make modifications to the iCharacter service interface, the character service and the character 
controller. So let's go to the I character service interface. And of course we need a new method, task service response. Let's return the list this time of all characters. We call this method delete character and the only parameter we have here is the ID now. And regarding the implementation, we can of course generate our method and then we can actually copy and paste the code of the update character method and paste this here in the delete character method. But of course we have to make a few changes. The first thing is adding the async keyword and then we have to fix the service response because we return a list of characters and not only one single character. So this is a list now. And then what we can do is we can change first or default to just first. I already mentioned that in an earlier lecture, but the difference is that first or default will return null if no matching entity was found and first throws an exception. So let's make use of that. Now, if however, a character has been found, we can simply remove it from our characters list. So characters remove character. And in the end, we want to return all the characters. And again, we can actually copy this from here. For instance, we want to return all characters. So character select, and then we map all the characters. And of course, this has to be changed as well. Okay, and now already the controller method. This is actually a combination of the get single and update character method. Now we can copy the get single method here, paste it down there. And the first change uh, we have to make, of course, is the method name. We call this one delete. We can also change the attribute, which is now HTTP delete, but again with the ID parameter. And we are returning a list of characters. So list get character DTO. And the body is almost the same as the body of the update character method. So let's copy this one here, paste it down there. And then we change the method we're calling the get character method with the ID, of course. All right, when everything is saved, we can go back to Swagger. Now in Swagger, we already see our delete method here. And let's try this with ID zero, for instance, just for reference again, when we have a look at all the characters, zero is Frodo, one is Sam. And when we now use ID zero, Frodo should be deleted. And this is the case because Sam is the only character left. Perfect, this works just fine. Our web API with all CRUD operations is done. It's time to save the data in a database with Entity Framework and SQL Server. Now, if you made it this far, you are definitely ready for the complete .NET Jumpstart course. You seem to have what it takes to build a .NET application with web API and Entity Framework completely by yourself from start to finish. In the next sections of this course, you will dive deep into Entity Framework with Code First Migration, SQL Server and all kinds of relationships, meaning one-to-one, one-to-many -one, one and many-to-many -many relationships. Additionally, you will learn how to implement authentication into your application with the help of JSON Web Tokens. This means users will be able to register, log in and create their very own RPG characters. And after that, you will do more than just CRUD by letting the role-playing characters fight against each other, even in a deathmatch. As a thank you and reward for completing this part of the course, I want to give you a pretty sweet discount. Make sure to use the link in the video description below. I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the complete 
کورس